Stuart, thank you for joining me today for Magnificent Memories. And it looks so you've got lovely weather where you are at the moment. Now, people will have heard of you, Stuart, Stuart Lawrence. And it's good to put a face to the name because you have written some amazing thought for the days for Living Stones. And I know that because I have read the great comments afterwards. And also, I know that you draw these fantastic pictures. You've got a real gift of writing and the pictures as well. <laughs> so I'm hoping that you might, when you're not too busy, because I know you're a busy man, be able to write us a thought for the day for Living Stones with some pictures. That would be fantastic. Now, I know you're a pastor, so tell us a little bit more about yourself, please. Well, I'm I'm going to be 74 years old this uh, Sunday. No, Saturday. Wow. Sunday. Sunday's over here is Father's Day. Yes. And uh, I'm going to be 74 on, on Saturday. And I, uh, I've had years of college. I was a actually a graphic design major in college and it was a, a co-op school so you would work at a job related to your field for one uh, quarter and then you would go to your classes the next quarter and so school paid for itself for me i was virtually debt free when i got out of college uh I had a bachelor's degree in, in graphic design and worked in uh, worked in the field for several years. And then my folks always told me that they thought I would be a good teacher. And so I went back and took a few classes, got my teaching license, got my grad, grad degree at the same time. So I taught junior high art for nine years. <laughs> and uh, this was back in the 80s. And then our family started growing. And so I needed to make some money because we like to eat. And so I, uh, one of the elders in our church, he said, you know, you'd really be good at selling long-term care insurance for American Express. And he's, and I said, I, I've had no training in sales at all. He says, well, you're a natural. That's what he told me. I said, I think you're just flattering. me." He goes, no, he says, I, I'd like to get you a, an interview with my uh, boss, the sales manager. And so I did. And long story short, it, everything clicked. And I, I worked in, uh, in the field for, in sales for like a nine, nine years. And then they wanted me to be the regional sales manager. So I was regional sales manager for like four years and had 30 agents uh, that were under me. And so all during this time, though, I was an elder in my church ever since 1978. I was an elder and we would we were working. I mean, we were kind of like lay ministers in a way because we worked jobs, but we would still preach uh, at church there. So I've been preaching since 1978. And uh, so now I'm I'm fully retired from insurance and everything, but I spend all my time. Uh, in the ministry, God has really seen fit to give me uh, these years uh, where I spend time uh, ministering, you know, to the flock and also to my family. Uh, like today, we're over here for our daughter. Our daughter works full time. She's a single mom of three. So she works full time. So we, we kind of like to help her out. So that that's uh, time well spent, I feel like. And uh, the thing I've always felt about time, even even when I was a younger man, was that God's not making any more time. That's right. You know, you can always you can always make more money if you if you need to, but God's not making any more time. So I find that I've become more judicial of my time the the uh, older I get. So, <laughs> and you don't look seventy four. I have to say, and. I think it's lovely. I can see that you've got such a lovely heart of gratitude towards the Lord. So I'm going to fire a few questions for you now, Stuart. 
for okay. magnificent memories. So, okay. Stuart, can you recall a time when you felt a strong sense of God's presence in your life? Oh, there's been many times, but one that probably sticks out would have been when my wife and I were uh, dating before we were married back in 1981. Uh, I took her on a date. We went to the ice cream shop, <laughs> you know, big, big spender here. You know, we went and she, she was totally happy with that. Uh, we went to the ice cream shop and while we were in there getting our double dip ice cream cones, there was a lady that was, had a bunch of kids in her car and she uh, needed help with her car. Her car conked out right in the ice cream store parking lot. And she came in and she says, sir, sir, could you help me? Could you help me, please? And I said, yeah, what's going on? So we went outside. So we got our car. You know, Lisa and I both went outside. And we got the car going. And so Lisa said she knew from that moment that that I was a minister and that, you know, that some of my time would be used for the ministry. It was, it was She knew kind of what she was getting into. So after ice cream, we walked over to the nearby park. And we were playing air tennis, which means you're playing tennis without a rack, without rackets. We were just fooling around out there, having fun, running around. So finally, we got kind of tired and uh, sat down on the bench there. And uh, Lisa said, Stuart, she said, you seem like a, a guy that really wants to have a lot of kids. And she said, so I, I need to let you know this that the doctors have told me it's very unlikely that i'll be ever ever be able to have children she says i just want you to know that so she gave like full what do you call it uh, i don't i can't think of the word right now but she she just has always been real honest with me and up front and she told me that and i said well you know what i said we'll just adopt kids and so it wasn't long after that. We had a very short um, engagement period. I think it was three months. And uh, we were actually married on the same day as Princess Diana, oh, <laughs> July right. 25th, 1981, on the same day. <laughs> we were married. But before that, um, we were at a little Bible study at some folks from our church. There were only 12 people there. And the man that actually planted our church back years ago, back in the early 60s, he was there. He was in town. And so at the end of the Bible study, we all stood up and held hands. And he said, uh, let's pray. And so he was he was praying and we were all agreeing with him. And uh, after that, he said, he said, someone here, I don't know who it is, someone here, the Lord wants to do a work in your body. And I don't know who it's for or what it is, but whoever it is, uh, I, I want you, you know, go ahead and accept it. The Lord wants to heal you. And uh, Lisa had not said anything to him about this situation at all. And so on the way, I was taking her back to her folks' house, which was about a 40 mile drive she said Stuart she said the Lord healed me tonight she said I felt this warm heat go through my body and she says I believe I'm healed and she went to the doctor the next week and they gave her they ran they ran tests on her and the doctors told her there's no reason why you can't have children and so we had two children, which our daughter, I'm at her house right now. This is kind of ironic, you know, the daughter that never was supposed to be. And we had a son that was never supposed to be. And so that was just the, I felt the Lord's presence there doing that, uh, that we had the Lord do that for us, uh, that Lisa was able to actually conceive and have children and that to me that was 
that was huge. Uh, I've got a lot of them. <laughs> I don't know how much time we have, but that's probably the one that sticks out in my mind the most is that uh, I thought about Abraham, you know, and he, he waited in faith till he was what 99 years old to God. You know, when he was younger, when he was 75, God said, you're going to have a son, you know, and he waited in faith all those years. And I, I thought about that many, many times. And so we had to wait a few years. It wasn't right off the bat, you know, when we first got married, it, it, it was a few years, but she came, I was still teaching school at the time. She came and picked me up. We had one car. She came, picked me up at school and she said, uh, baby Lawrence is going to be delivered May 31st, 1983. And so that was a wonderful thing for us. And then 17 months later, came Daniel. And we had a son. So that was huge for yes. us. That is an incredible story. It really is. And a comfort to you both as well. And the Lord's faithfulness is just, it's just incredible, isn't it? And an yes. answer to prayer. And it's wonderful. I think that Lisa was honest in the beginning, and also your your faith as well, both of you, it, it just shows you what God can do. And that's very encouraging for all of us today. Great. How close would you say that you feel to God at the moment in, in this time, Stuart? Well, I, I feel very close, uh, most always, but, you know, when we were in Ireland, I really had a really close encounter, <laughs> and it was amazing. We, uh, of course, I'm not used to driving on your side of the road and <laughs> on the other side of the car, and the roads there, as you know, are very narrow. People even kind of said, are you driving? You know, people <laughs> over there, they said, you're from America and you're driving? I said, yeah. I said, I think I just got in under the wire because the guy at the car rental place, he thought since I'm turning 74 here Saturday, I don't know if it's age 74 or 75, they don't even rent cars to, to people at that age. And so he was kind of amazed about that. But so this was an amazing day. We, we went all the way around. Uh, we were there three weeks. We went all the way around Ireland, uh, not Northern Ireland, but we started in Dublin, spent a few days there. We moved down to uh, Blarney, and uh, went to Blarney Castle and visited the grounds there. That was amazing. I stayed at Blarney Woolen Mills there. And from there, we went, pushed on to uh, Kells Bay, which is over by the Ring of Kerry. Uh, beautiful, right on the west, southwest uh, shore of uh, Ireland there. And we spent four days there. That, that was gorgeous. And then we went to Westport, which is the northwest uh side of the island um and we were there i think four days and then our next place was a, a country b and b that was in kind of the middle of the country and so we didn't have a working gps in the car and my, our phones my gps wasn't working on my phone i should have bought the extended package on my phone and we had no gps at all and we, those roads especially in the interior, those old country roads. A couple of times we ended up on sheep paths, you know, wow. that were, mm. were not really for cars at all. <laughs> no. and, so, what to, and so I didn't want to get caught at night driving on these roads. And and so it was start of the sun. It wasn't cold. We had a few hours left, but I was starting to get a little nervous. And so we stopped because um, we could not find this place. It, it was called Locken Mill House, and it was a country house uh, close to, I'm trying to think, of, uh, Coven, C-A-V-E-N. Coven, I think, was one of the close uh, towns to it. There was another one, smaller town that was even closer. But So I told Lisa, I said, you know, I'm going to go up here. There's a taxi station here in Coven. I said, I'm going to go up here and and use the restroom, maybe I can get some directions from somebody. 
And so yeah. I went in the Texaco and went back to the, they don't call them restrooms there. They call them toilets. So I was, went to, to the toilet room or to the water closet or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and I, the only thing I said, Jeannie was, uh, Lord, please show us the way. And that's all I said in the in the bathroom there. And I walked out, and there was a table right next to the bathroom door. And there was a really kindly looking older couple sitting there at the table eating. And I said, "Sir, could I bother you for a minute?" He said, "Sure." He he just was a typical Irish looking man. He was probably eighty five. 90 years old, I don't know, he was an older guy, big bulbous nose and big ears, and, and just a really sweet looking man. And his wife was, was, that was a very sweet looking woman too. They were both up in their years. And so he said, Where is it that you're trying to find? And I said, Well, it's called Lock and Mill House. And uh, I said, C Do you know where that is? And he looked at me, he says, I know exactly where that is. I said, you do? And he said, yes. And I said, could you like scribble some directions down on this sheet of paper? He says, I'll do better than that. I'll take you there. Isn't that lovely? Lovely attitude. And then his wife looked at me. She says, would you like a cup of coffee? <laughs> and so they, they, and he says, I do want to let you know this. He says, I drive really slow. And I said, well, I'll be right at home because I've been driving really slow too. <laughs> but I just felt like the Lord, you know, that guy was right. I almost bumped into the table when I opened the door of the of the bathroom coming out. And this man and his wife were sitting right there. He said, I know exactly where that is. I'll take you there. So our Lord is so faithful, you know, and there's times when I regretted having anxiety about things and I thought, why was, why was I worried? Why, why do we have dread, apprehension, worry, and fear and all those things that are from the devil? You know, why do, why do I even entertain that? So that was another lesson in my book where I felt particularly close to God at that, at that moment. That's lovely. That really is. That's a, a, another beautiful story there for us. So what would you say your earliest memory was of feeling God's presence in your life? What was your earliest memory, Stuart? Okay, I grew up in a family that we were not really a church-going family. Okay. Uh, my dad my dad sat at home on Sunday and read the funny papers, you know, and mom would take us to church on, on Sunday and, and uh, uh, she would take us to church uh, at Easter and Christmas. And then when we got a little older and we became Boy Scouts, uh, the uh, United Methodist Church had a Boy Scout troop. And so we started going because of the Boy Scout troop. You know, it wasn't because of Jesus or anything. Right. And so I think uh, it was, I had a neighbor, his name's David Rose. And he was always a very evangelical you know, I grew up with him. He lived like four houses down the street. I grew up in the inner city, Indianapolis, Indiana. And David Rose lived right down the, the street from me. And he and his folks went to the Nazarene church all the time. And so he asked me, he says, would you like to come to uh, a special uh, re revival service? that's at our church, you know, coming up. And I said, yeah, I, I would go with you. And so we went and with his mom and dad, uh, Paul and Bernice Rose, and they, they were just really sweet, sweet, loving people. And I uh, went with them to the evangelistic uh, or the uh, re revival. And the preacher Start, and I don't remember exactly what he said, but he, he, we, Dave and I were sitting right on the front row and he came up and he had a gown on, you know, and I, I still remember his, he came right up in front of me and he was waving his arms, you know, like he wasn't looking at me in the eye, but he was talking to the whole audience and it was just his arms up and down. Would you please come? Would you please come? 
you know, don't let uh, anyone keep you from coming. Please come. Please come up to the front. And, you know, Jeannie, I just, I just sat there. I didn't go up front. But I did feel like the Lord was speaking to me because on the way home, Mrs. Rose asked me, she said, Stuart, did, uh, uh, how do you feel after that service? And I remember telling her, I think I was about 10 or 11, maybe 12 years old at the oldest. I remember telling her, I felt like sunshine. Is in me. That's what I told her. And she was the same woman. I started reading the Bible then. My brother had been given a Bible by our great grandmother, and she gave it to my older brother Steve. And it just laid around the house. And so I started reading the Psalms. So one day I went down to Mrs. Rose's house and I, I asked her, I said, uh, Mrs. Rose, I said, I've been reading the Bible. And I said, I, it, it's comforting to me, but I don't understand it. I don't understand what I'm reading. And I, like I say, I was about 11, maybe 10 or 12. I don't know, somewhere in that you know, real young age. And she said, Stuart, keep reading. Someday you will understand. Not that I understand everything, but I understand more than I did when I was 12. And she was so right, you know. And so that was a time when I, that's one of the early memories I have when, uh, of, of God's presence in my life at an early age. Isn't it amazing how the Lord uses other people? Like this Mrs. Rose, she sort of challenged you and she asked you questions and she was wise really in the things that she said yes, as, yes. as well. And you could see really as you're saying that how the Lord was starting to change your life as well. Yes, so yes. in which area would you now like to grow most in spiritually would you say i i off off hands i think i would say like like what peter said you know to grow in grace and in the knowledge of my lord and savior jesus christ you know grace there's a lot of ways to look at grace it's many times described as as unmerited favor which I, it is, but it's also in the Strong's Concordance, it also talks about it being a divine influence upon the heart. And I, I need that for change. I need that divine influence on my heart to change daily. You know, uh, God is the potter. I am the clay. I'm a lump. And so I'm up on the potter's wheel. I used to when I taught art, I taught pottery. Kids really, junior high kids really like it because, you know, you teach them how to center a lump of clay on the wheel and they, they really go to town. They can make some pretty cool things. And so God is, I, I always think about that. God is the potter. Like, when, like Jeremiah went down to the potter's house. Yes. And he's the potter and I just want to remain pliable. I want my heart to remain pliable in his hands. And, and to do that, you know, he, he gives me that grace. He gives me that, that divine influence upon my heart. And in the grace and in the knowledge, you know, the word knowledge there, sometimes the word knowledge is epignosis, which is full knowledge. And sometimes it's just gnosis, which is knowledge. It's just a, uh, it's the act of human knowing, you might, you might say it's, uh, G N O S I S in the Greek, but it, it's uh, to to grow in that knowledge of Jesus Christ every day, and to remain pliable in my heart by His divine influence upon it, with the grace that He bestows on upon me. And I never want to turn the grace of God into lasciviousness, which yeah. means no restraint. That's right. you know, some people. So I don't ever want to take it as a given or as a loose thing because people do that and they say, well, I'll just go ahead and keep sinning and, and God will forgive me. Well, there comes a point when I think we can become calloused 
in our hearts. Exactly. And I want to re- and I want to remain pliable, Jeannie. I just want to remain pliable in, in His hands. Yes, I think that's so good because. You are right. The Lord wants us, Stuart, to have a teachable heart. And like you mentioned, the potter there and Jeremiah. And God wants our hearts to be soft and so that he and teachable and so that we can grow in his grace, as you're so beautifully put. So what is a small step you feel you could take? to draw closer to the Lord? Yeah, that's a good question. (laughs) All of them have been good questions. Thank you. To get closer. Yeah. Yeah. So is there a small step that you feel you could take that would you think would draw you closer to him? Yeah, I I feel like just, uh, I feel like, Becoming pure can be a process uh, in First John. John talks about it. He says that we, um, I'm not sure if I can quote it off the top of my head, but he says, when we see him as he is, we will be like, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone that has this hope in himself purifies himself, even as he, even as Jesus, he is pure. So if I have that hope that when I see Jesus, I'm being changed to look more and more like him every day, that to me, purity is a daily process and you're talking about small steps it is it's a daily process and as we uh as john says we that have this hope uh in us purifies ourselves as he is pure that's first john i want to say chapter two or three uh i don't have my bible with me handy here uh but it, it's it, it's that process that that you're taking every day when you have that hope and when you see him, uh, you're going to be like him. You're going to see him as he is. And hopefully by then, if, if, if we have allowed that purification process and that hope in us to see him again, to see him as he is, then we are going to be changed into that same image from glory to glory by the spirit of the Lord, Paul said. Yeah, so true. I think, Stuart, you have challenged us today. There's much to take away and look at our own hearts as well. And can I say thank you for this interview? You have been a delight, and I would love to interview you again sometime. So, Stuart, thank you for joining me today for Magnificent memories god bless you thank you Stuart. god bless you Jeannie. thank you very much for the opportunity I really you are welcome it. thank you